Thank you for watching this teaching video from Oak Tree Community Church in South Bend, Indiana. Please subscribe to our channel and check out our other videos. Our mission is to help people come to know Jesus better and love Him more every day. We believe that this will not only help our own spiritual growth, but also help us better influence our communities and world for Christ. For more information about Oak Tree, please visit our website at oaktreechurch.com where you'll find past message series, online giving options, and more information about our discipleship process we call The Path. We'd love to hear from you in the comments or through our website contact form. Now please enjoy this message. So we are working our way through the, um, I almost said the gospel, the book, just, you know, it's where my brain is, right? Working our way through the book of Zechariah, and it's not one of those places we spend a ton of time, and, um, um, but I hope, uh, this is our seventh week, and we are in chapter five, so if you'd like to uh, turn or scroll or swipe or whatever you do to get to chapter five in your Bible, uh, yeah, the book of Zechariah. Um, quick history, uh, Zechariah is one of two prophets that were sent to the nation of Israel after they were released from captivity from uh, Babylon and, and then Persia. So uh, Assyria had taken some of Israel captive, Babylon came, took the rest of them captive, and uh, finally the whole nation, it, it took a series of, a series of attempts, but uh, finally the whole nation was in exile by the year 586 B.C. Well, um, uh, in uh, 539, the king of Persia, Cyrus, said, go back to your country and build your temple. Okay, And so a man by the name of Zerubbabel led about 50,000 people back to uh, the land of Israel, back to Jerusalem, and they were going to rebuild the temple. They started. They got the process underway. Uh, it never really finished, there were a bunch of uh, political issues, there was infighting, division, all sorts of things. And so God sent two prophets, an older man by the name of Haggai and a younger man by the name of Zechariah to encourage the people to build the temple. You need to get this done. Um, in fact, in, in, in Haggai, uh, it was a little bit harsher. That's why we skipped him. Zechariah is much more encouraging. So uh, Haggai, <laughs> a little bit, a little bit stricter, a little bit harsher, and he said, "Why?" If, if God through the prophet said, "Why is my house lying in ruins? Why is the temple lying in ruins? And for the past 15 years, you've been remodeling your own homes." I understand that you want a nice place to live. I understand that that the city has been desolate for 70 years, but. Really, 15 years, you can't work on the temple? <laughs> you know, and, and so they, they were living, in fact, uh, the, the terminology, those of you who have like hardwood flooring in your houses and, you know, really nice, you know, whatever. Uh, he specifically mentions you live in paneled houses. <laughs> you live in paneled houses and yet the temple is, is lying in ruins. And so Zechariah came along about the same time, and gave some encouragement as well as a little bit of a judgment. We're going to see some judgment passages, or some judgment visions today. And between Haggai and Zechariah, uh, the people responded, and with five, within five years, the temple was completed. Now, they didn't keep it up, and it was, you know, it fell into ruins again. And about 80 years later, Ezra had to come along and say, let's do this again. So, I mean, it wasn't like this, you know, one and done type thing. But at least at this time, Zechariah is prophesying, he's preaching to a group of people who had come out of exile. They were back in their land, but the land was still pretty desolate. They were still trying to get their feet under them. They were working on their own places, but not God's place quite yet. And in the first uh, four chapters, uh, what we've found so far is that Zechariah is going to see a series of eight visions all in one night. And in fact, last week we got halfway, uh, halfway through, we got the first four visions, and last week we came to vision five and we found out that he had fallen asleep in the middle of the process. <laughs> he sees four, it wears him out, which is normal for visions because they're not, they're not like dreams where they're passive and we're just sort of watching a movie. 
But in a vision, the person is interacting. They're asking questions, the emotion and the feeling and the sights and the smells and everything. It, it, they are there. And so by the time he gets through four of these, very quickly, trying to figure all this stuff out, he's exhausted. He takes a nap. And in chapter four, an angel comes by and says, all right, get up. You've had your nap. Let's, let's keep working, right? So we come to chapter five today, and there will be two more visions, number six and seven out of eight. And uh, if you've been watching online or listening online, or if you've been here, I've been talking about the UFOs, right? There are UFOs in the Bible. We have finally come to the UFO passage. I hope you're not disappointed because I've built it up so much that I hope it's not like anticlimactic. <laughs> uh, we're in chapter five. There are two visions. The first one is in verses one through four, and then uh, verses five through 11. And they are actually interconnected. They're not completely standalone. They, they do have a couple of connections that, that um, I'll try to point out. And um, uh, what we've seen so far is that the first series, or this first half of, of, um, of visions, were very encouraging. You know, God is going to judge the nations. And Israel's like, yay, it's about time, right? In fact, in the first vision, they asked, right? When are you going to finally judge the nations? I'm going to do it. You have to trust me. Do it on my time. Okay? Well, in visions 6 and 7 here in chapter 5, uh, the tone changes a little bit, and the, the, the attention is not just on judging the Gentile nations who have hurt and oppressed Israel. Now it's on judging Israel a little bit as well. Just because they come out of exile, just because, all right, you've been punished, you've had the discipline that I promised you back in Deuteronomy, it's happened, they may have been tempted to think, now we're off the hook, everything's cool, we've done the sin, we've done the time, and now we're back in the land, and everything's going to be cool, we can do anything we want. And God says, not so fast, not so fast, that's not how it works. So, let's take a look at this first one, and... Um, one of the great things I like about um, visions and, and prophecy is that many, many times it's interpreted for us right in the text. We don't have to make it up. We don't have to guess. Some things are certainly harder than others, there's no doubt. But you'll, you'll see in here that um, you know, if it weren't for the interpretation that's built in, we would be like, this is definitely UFO stuff. This is conspiracy theory. This is weird. Well, he's going to tell us what it means, so that's okay. Chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. Then I turned to look, and there was a flying scroll. That's not the UFO, because it would not be identified then, right? Flying scroll. It's a flying scroll. And, and, and someone asked me, what do you see? And I replied, I see a flying scroll. <laughs> not, not that difficult, right? I see a flying scroll 30 feet long, 15 feet wide. Okay, so just pause there for just a second. For those of you who are in the room, if you're online, you can't see this quite you know, exactly the same, but if you're in the room, here's the size of the thing. From the front of the platform here to that back wall is your 30 feet, okay? So it's, that's how wide the thing is. So then 15 feet is from that wall to about the aisle, give or take, okay? So think of a sheet, a big, I mean, piece of paper. It's a scroll, but it's unrolled. Okay, this isn't like, you know, 15 by 30 all rolled up. 15 by 30 feet unrolled, we're going to see writing on it that is the size of that, you know, floor space right there. Okay, a um, little bit, just a little bit taller than a, a standard billboard that you see on the side of the road, and uh, not quite as long. It was usually about 14 by 48. Don't ask me how I know that. It was about 14 by 48, and this is 15 by 30. So not exactly, but it's pretty big, right? It's pretty big. And uh, if it's going to be flying through the sky, um, not attached to an airplane, but there's writing on it, it's just hanging there. And don't forget, this is at night. All of these visions are at night. So I don't know if the thing is glowing. I don't know if it's, you know, luminescent writing on the thing, but somehow, you know, maybe, maybe in the vision, you know, he was able to see everything, but... We've got this huge banner, basically, this huge poster billboard in the sky, 30 by, 50, or by, 30 by 15 feet. And the speaker, verse 3, went on to say, here, here's, here's the interpretation, here's what it is. This is a curse traveling across the whole earth, all the land. Now, 
Some translations may say all the land, the whole land, and that may be just Israel, the whole earth. Um, the, the, the Hebrew text could go either way there. For example, he says, according to the curse, whoever steals will be removed from the community. Or on the other hand, according to the curse, whoever swears falsely will suffer the same fate. What does that sound like to you? What does that remind you of? Ten Commandments, right? So you've got stealing is the eighth commandment. Now, there are some people who think that uh, with the two tablets, you know, God wrote, 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 you know, inscribed two tablets with the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, gave them to Moses, and Moses was supposed to take them down and, and give them to the uh, Jewish people. They say, well, there's two tablets and Ten Commandments, so it's obviously five and five. You know, it just makes sense. And if you look at all the paintings, you look at all the artwork, it's always five and five. What's really funny is that they're five and five in Roman numerals. Have you ever seen that? <laughs> it's not five and five in Hebrew letters. It's always Roman numerals uh, uh, on, on the paintings because, of course, they were done you know, much, much later. <laughs> so, you know, whatever. I always find that interesting. So you got five and five. Well, on the second five, number eight, of course, is right in the middle uh, thou shalt not steal. All right? So now, the second one could go one of two directions. If it's just swearing falsely, like it says here in um, uh, verse 3, whoever swears falsely will suffer the same fate. That could be number 9. Because number 9 is perjury. By the way, let me burst maybe somebody's bubble here. There, there, there are a lot of people who say, that the ninth commandment is thou shalt not lie. It's not true. It doesn't say you're not supposed to lie. Lying is, no, lying is not fine. Uh, the ninth commandment is not thou shalt not lie. The ninth commandment is you shall not bear false witness testimony against your neighbor. That's not the same as lying. This is actually you should not perjure. You shall not swear that your neighbor did something that your neighbor did not do. Okay, so number nine is actually perjury. Don't, don't lie on the stand when you're giving testimony. Don't bear false witness. So that's one option. Then that really throws off the, you know, why would he give eight and nine instead of, you know, something else? Well, look at verse uh, four. Um, I will send it out, says the Lord who rules over all, the Lord of hosts, the, the Jehovah Sabaoth, depending on your translation. It will enter the house of the thief and of the person who swears falsely, what? in my name, and it'll in the land in the middle of the house. We'll come back to that. So is it just swearing falsely? Is it just perjury, or is it misusing God's name? Ah, that's a different commandment, isn't it? That's number three, which just so happens to be the middle, if you have five and five, on the left-hand side. So if it's number three and number eight, he has chosen the middle of each tablet, the middle of each set, probably to represent the whole thing. Um, as we'll see in, in a little bit here, those two are going to show up again. So I think there's probably a specific reason he said not stealing, theft is a major issue, and swearing, and I think it's probably this one, swearing falsely in my name, misusing my name for your benefit, right? These two things... I am going to point out, and if you do them, you will be under a curse. Now, first of all, a couple of things. This is still the nation of Israel, okay? The, the, the word curse here can also be translated oath. It's sort of the it's context helps us determine this. So is it God is swearing an oath? But there's, there's a curse. There's a, I think it's a curse that goes out over the land because of their oath. If we go back to the book of Exodus, um, we find that God is giving these Ten Commandments, and, and before he gives the commandments, he says, here is a covenant that I would like to make with the, the nation of Israel. You're my people. I've rescued you for, from Egypt. We've done the Passover thing. We've done the wandering through the desert a little bit, not the full you know, 40 years, but just a little bit. We've done the Red Sea. I've proven myself to you. I've proven my power. I've proven my trustworthiness, my character. And here we are at the foot of Mount Sinai. And before I give you my law, here's what I would like to know. Will you obey it? 
Are you as a nation willing to come into a covenant with me? I will be your God. You will be my people. I will lead you in the right way and you will follow me. Will you do that? And any smart person or anyone with hindsight would look at that and say, I'm not sure we could do that. I would love to. I would love to be in covenant with you, but if, if it's up to me, if I have to obey in order to get the blessings, if I have to obey in order to, if, if there's anything on my side to uphold, there's a pretty good chance I'm not going to do it well, right? Okay, of course, we get the benefit of hindsight as well. Well, they didn't say that. What they said was, all the Lord has said we will do. And Moses said, are you sure? You know, this is not just a verbal. You have to check the terms and conditions checkbox. Yes, I've read the terms and conditions. And then you have to click accept. All right, this is a multi-step process to make sure that if something happens, it's not God's fault, right? And they're like, yes, of course we're sure. You know, God just did all these great things for us. All the Lord has said we will do. Click, click, done. And then he starts to unpack the law. First, the Ten Commandments, and then the other 600. <laughs> In fact, there were a total of 613. We get 10 of them. You know, we think of the big 10. Man, 10 is not that hard. Ten Commandments? Wouldn't, wouldn't you love it if our entire law system, our entire judicial system in the U.S. or wherever country you're in is just 10 laws? Well, if we were to go back maybe to Genesis chapter 3, we would find an entire judicial system that was based on one law, right? Don't eat the fruit off of this one tree. We couldn't even handle that. <laughs> we could. I mean, God's like, I've given you literally the entire planet full of stuff that you can eat. That you, you can go and you don't even have to stay here. I want to meet you here. That's what the orchard was for, by the way. The orchard was the place where, where humanity was supposed to meet with God. But we weren't supposed to stay there. Okay, they weren't living or they weren't supposed to live there. I mean, with just two of them, it probably worked. But as, as, as humanity grew, they were supposed to multiply and fill the earth. Right? The garden, the orchard, was the place to come and meet with God and have perfect relationship. And he's like, just don't eat the fruit off of that tree. You have everything else. Everything else. The whole planet's yours. And they're like, ooh, one tree. Right? It's like the wet paint sign. Right? I've used this illustration. I love this illustration. Wet paint. I would never. I don't like stuff on my hands. I don't like lotion. I don't like creams. I don't, I'm just not that big of a fan of that. So I don't like stuff on my hands like that. So if there was a wet paint, you know, if one of these walls was just painted, I'm not going to go up and touch it because now i got paint on my fingers and I have to wash my hands and it's just really stupid, right? Until they put up the sign that says, wet paint, do not touch. Now I'm like, now I have to touch it. I mean, just, I, mean now I, have, I mean, I am willing to risk the little bit of pain on my hand just because you told me not to. Right? That's our sin nature. That's inside. Adam and Eve did not even have that inside of them yet. And they couldn't handle one law. And we think 10 would be fine. And God gave Israel 613 of these things. And they were supposed to memorize them and live them every day perfectly to stay in covenant with God. How long did that last? Well, not even to the end of the day, probably. And certainly not to the end of the 40-day period that Moses was up on the mountain talking with God. In that 40 days, what did Israel do? They built an idol, a calf, a cow made out of gold. And Aaron, Moses' brother, brothers are problems. Aaron, Moses' brother, <laughs> stood there and looked at Israel and said, This is the God who brought you out of Egypt. While Moses is actually talking to the God who brought you out of Egypt, this right here is the God who brought you out of Egypt. And they bowed down and they worshiped that. They could not get a month into the covenant without the entire, almost the entire nation just you know, completely breaching the contract. And for 1,400 years, Israel breached the contract, broke the covenant over and over and over. That's why the Old Testament is so long. 
Because God kept sending prophets for centuries. Come back to me. Come back to me. Come back to me. Oh, we're saying all the right words. We're saying all the right prayers. We're doing all the sacrifices. We're doing all of the, uh, the songs. We're doing everything that you told us to do. And repeatedly in the prophets, we find God saying, I want your heart, not just your hands. I want your heart, not just your sacrifices. I want your heart, not just your words. He said, these people, their hearts are far from me. I want your heart. That's never changed. God's wanted our heart from Genesis 1 all the way through Genesis or through Revelation 22. The whole thing is about He wants us to come back into fellowship with Him. And we cannot do it on our own. And that's why Jesus came. That's why Jesus died. That's why Jesus was resurrected. That's why Easter is a thing. That's why Easter exists at all. That's why Christmas exists at all. Because we can't do it. And God says, I know you can't do it. And so here's the solution. Here are my eternal terms and conditions. Will you believe in Jesus as the only way to be made right with me? To come into a right relationship? But at this time, under Zechariah's ministry, they were still under that old covenant. Israel. They were still under that law. They were still under that, those terms and conditions where if you obey me, you will be blessed. And if you disobey me, you will be cursed. Now what's interesting is that of all of the things that they could have done and God punished them for over the years, the one thing that you say the final straw was worshiping false gods, worshiping idols. We see that in the prophets more than anything else. How can you possibly worship this piece of tree? In fact, there's one passage, it's hilarious, where God says they'll chop down a tree, they'll use part of it for firewood, and then they'll build a God out of the other part. How stupid is that? I love God's sarcasm and the irony and just the whole thing. He's like, you carve it eyes, but they can't see. You carve it a mouth, but it can't speak. You carve it ears, but it can't hear. And here I am saying, hello, <laughs> come back to me. And you're worshiping this little tree stump that you burned its brother. You know, for firewood, because you wanted to eat last night. That was the final straw. That's what sent them into exile. That's why they were taken captive, because that was the last straw. God said, you will not worship other gods. After they came back to the land, after the restoration, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, they've come back like under Zechariah. You know what's interesting? Israel as a nation has never, ever gone back to idolatry. Ever. Not in 2,500 years has the nation ever gone back to idolatry. They learned their lesson on that one. We'll see other things that they have done instead, but they haven't done that one. And Zechariah said, you are still under the law. And so it's a reminder of the full Ten Commandments, and, and the Ten Commandments themselves were a summary of the whole law. All of the other 603 commandments fit inside the Ten somewhere. It was sort of like, a, uh, um, you know, like in our Constitution here in the U.S., we've got the article and then we've got all the points underneath it. So it's like the, the, the Israel's law code had ten articles and then all of these little subpoints that fit into each one of them. That's, that's how it worked. And so these two, I think they summarize the whole thing. God is reminding them, you still, <laughs> you still have a law code. You still have to obey me. This is why you're building the temple. You're still going to be doing sacrifices. But notice, it's a curse. You took the oath, but the oath is a curse. The book of... Um, Galatians. Let me show you this. The book of Galatians, chapter three. By the way, um, in our in our new soap cards here, um, we're finishing up the the book of Second Chronicles, and then we're going to be going into Galatians for four weeks. So um, uh, that'll be fun. In Galatians chapter three, uh, he's uh, the the apostle Paul is talking about people who try to put themselves back under the law after they've been released from it. Um, and look at verse ten. Galatians chapter 3, verse 10. All who rely on doing the works of the law are under what? Under a curse. The law in itself put people under a curse 
Not because God wanted to curse them, but because there was no way that they could obey it completely. So it's sort of like a built-in curse. God said, here is the whole thing. I know you can't keep it, and I know you're going to disobey, and I know you're going to have to be punished for that, but you're the ones who said you wanted to try. I have another way, but you wanted to try this one. So everyone who relies on doing the works of the law are, are under a curse because it is written, cursed is everyone who does not keep on doing everything written in the book of the law. By the way, there are people today who teach that Christians, church age people, right, you and me, are still under the law. Not the whole thing. I mean, we don't have to eat the certain things because, you know, who doesn't want bacon and, and some of the other stuff? We are, we're willing to throw out some of the law, but we want to keep part of the law. We have to keep uh, maybe the moral commands. We have to keep part, but we don't have to keep the whole thing. Um, the Apostle Paul, quoting, by the way, from the Old Testament, um, says, cursed is everyone who does not keep the whole thing. You don't get to pick and choose what you want in the law. Now, the church has never been under the law at all. We've never been bound by the Mosaic law. It was even in the Old Testament. Had we existed in the Old Testament, it was only for the nation of Israel. And then they were released at the cross as well. So, We've got this law, and the law brought a curse. And so in, in, uh, in Zechariah chapter 5, verse 3, we have, there's this curse that's traveling across the whole land. And he gives these two examples, the theft and the, the swearing falsely. Now, notice that whoever steals, verse 3, will be removed from the community, banished from the covenant community of God. And the whoever swells, uh, swears falsely, uh, will suffer the same fate. If you go into to verse 4, these people, it will enter the house of the, of the thief and the person who swears falsely in my name. It will land in the middle of the house and destroy both timber and stones. Like the stuff that you would normally build your house with. Now, I went back and I looked under the law in the Old Testament. I'm like, okay, exactly what, you know, if somebody stole something, were they banished from the community and their house was completely de demolished? No. <laughs> that wasn't the punishment under the law, under the Old Testament law. That wasn't the punishment that existed when Zechariah was there. Uh, they had to restore, they had to pay back, you know, you know, whatever. But it's not like they were kicked out of the covenant community and everything was like burned to the ground or destroyed. So, one of two things has to be the case here. Either... God is changing the rules in the middle of the covenant, which um, I don't think that's legal, even for God. I mean, I, I mean, he, he said, he, because he started the covenant, he, he set up the covenant by swearing by his own name. So he would have to, I mean, like go back on his word. And I don't think God can do that. In fact, I know God can't do that. So it can't be that he's changing the rules in the middle of the game for the nation. What I think is a more likely um, uh, in, uh, understanding here is that we're looking ahead to the kingdom. We're looking ahead to when Messiah is actually here on the earth ruling. And part of that is because the majority of the book of Zechariah looks forward to that. And the people did not know when Messiah was going to show up. Okay? They thought it could happen at any time. They were anticipating, expecting it any time. Now, Daniel had given some information that they may or may not have known that it was going to be some time. But God is saying, listen, I take this stuff seriously. And if this meant that he was changing the rules in the middle of the thing, first of all, uh, I don't know of anyone who, or, or, where this was actually carried out. So even if this was supposed to happen, you know, thieves were banished from the covenant community and their houses were knocked down and destroyed. I don't think it ever happened. So now once again we have, you know, the, the Israel, you know, breaking, you know, breaking the rules. But I think it's pointed forward. I think it's like in my kingdom when everything is perfect, when everything is set back the way it's supposed to be. Um, this is the way it's going to be. Judgment will be executed very quickly and it will be harsh. And I think that fits the overall tenor of the, the Old Testament discussion, the Old Testament teaching on the kingdom, because it will be a kingdom that is characterized by peace and righteousness. 
and there will be punishment for sin, and those who are blatant rebels will be destroyed. They'll be, they'll be killed. Because Jesus is not going to allow that in His kingdom. People who break the law will have fines. There will be animal sacrifices. There will be other things. And they'll have to pay their fines. But apparently theft and misusing God's name, even in the kingdom, are going to be upheld as a really, really bad thing. So, the first set here is a reminder. This first vision is a reminder. It's not encouraging, is it? I mean, sort of. Uh, the first set is a reminder of what God said, I'm going to do, this is who I am, this is who you are in relation to me, let's not forget that you know I am God and you are not, and ultimately, in my kingdom, things are going to be different. I actually had slides. Um, <laughs> you're like, what a great title slide just sitting there on the screen. Uh, the curse of the Mosaic Law was written on a huge flying scroll. The theft is number eight. Misusing God's name is number three. Or perjury, number nine, if you want to go that way. Uh, what else did I... Some awesome stuff that I had for you. Curses and oath. Curses of disobeying the law were binding on them. Man, I'm good. I just went straight through my notes and didn't share anything with you at all. Um, let's see. What's next? All right. Well, I think I covered everything. <laughs> This would remind Israel that they're still under the Mosaic Law even after their return from exile and the severity of the punishments uh, are not what we see in the Old Testament, so they probably point to the Messianic Kingdom. Seventh vision, I think we'll be able to pick up from here. Chapter 5, see I get going and I forget, right? Chapter 5, verse, um, verse 5. After this, the angelic messenger who had been speaking with me went out and said, look, see what's leaving. So we've got four verses here for the, the sixth vision, and he's got, got the scroll, and he's got this information about the curse, and now the angel says, hey, let's go look at another one. You know, he's still processing. He's still groggy, I think. You know, <laughs> and, he's, you know, and, and he's still processing this, and the angel's like, I got another one. Come outside. Check this out. Look, see what's leaving. And I asked, what is it? And he said, it's a basket for measuring grain that is moving away from here. Uh, the, the Hebrew word, and we'll see this all over the Old Testament, is an ephah, right? An ephah. And it's a basket that um, somewhere between five and ten gallons dry. Somewhere between a half bushel and a bushel, depending on who you asked. I looked at several different dictionaries, and everybody gave me a different um, you know, measurement. I'm like, okay, well, we'll split the difference and say it could be anywhere in five to ten gallon pail. Right? All right. This, by the way, is our UFO. I'm just telling you this right now because as we see what's going on, you're like, but it's an EFA. Well, but we don't know how big it is, so that way it's unidentified. Anticlimactic, I'm sure. It's moving. Moreover, he said, now if you're following it in a different translation, you might run into an issue here. We'll talk through it. Moreover, he said, this is their eye. Maybe yours says iniquity or sin or something. We'll come back to that. Throughout all the earth. And then a round lead cover was apparently on it, and it was raised up so that Zechariah and the angel could peek inside, revealing a woman sitting in the basket. So there's your alien inside your UFO. Okay? Uh, he's, he, he then said, uh, this woman represents wickedness, and he <laughs> pushed her down into the basket and placed the lead cover on top. That's great. We'll come back to that too. There's a lot to come back to. Then I looked again. I saw two women going forth with the wind in their wings. They had wings like those of a stork. I'm telling you, UFO stuff going on here. And they lifted up the basket between the earth and the sky. And I asked the messenger who was speaking to me, where are they taking the basket? And he replied, to build a temple for her in the land of Babylonia. Um, uh, when it's finished, she will be placed there in her own residence. Well, that's simple enough to understand, right? So we can just move on to chapter 6. <laughs> oh, this is fun. I love this stuff. Okay, now notice most of this, most of it is interpreted for us. We don't have to guess what it is. And the stuff that's not interpreted is, for the most part, fringe issues that really don't you know, speak so much to the, to the issue. So <laughs> what's the issue? So there's a basket. There's this ephah that apparently has a, a lead cover. A heavy lead cover. It says, uh, I think in the Hebrew text, it says it's a talent 
which is like 60 pounds. Okay, so you've got this 60 pound lead cover on a, like a five gallon pail or five or 10 gallon bucket. Isn't that overkill? Isn't that overkill just a little bit? And usually, and, and, and unless it was made out of clay, an ephah was more like a basket, right? You know, wicker or straw or something. Wouldn't this just completely crush it to the ground? I mean, just annihilate the basket anyway? So obviously, he's trying to describe what he saw. And um, uh, I would get, by the way, if there's a woman sitting inside, then she's either a really, really tiny woman <laughs> who fits inside this basket, or the basket is exaggerated and it's larger than a normal basket. Um, so quick poll, do you think, and obviously we haven't seen it, do you think, I've got my opinion, and opinions really don't matter, but just curious, do you think maybe uh, it's a normal sized basket with a tiny woman inside, or do you think it's an oversized basket? Which, tiny, uh, tiny woman in, in, in a regular basket, anybody? Oversized basket. Wow. Okay, now I have to ask why. I wasn't going to you, but but everybody's just like oversized basket. Why do you think it's an oversized basket? Because there's a lot of wickedness? Oh, nice. Because it says the woman represents wickedness, right? Good. A lot of wickedness. Why else? I mean, like everybody's like oversized basket. Yeah, so... So the scroll was obviously exaggerated for size for the vision, right? And so it makes sense that the basket would be as well. That's the, that's the conclusion that I came to. But I really like the whole, there's a ton of wickedness and it takes a big basket to do that. So that's really good. And the lid was big and heavy, right? So it had to be big, you know, so the lid could go on. Good. It just, it just, see the stuff, is, I mean, it seems weird when you first read it. But if you give it three seconds, it starts to, you know... It starts to work itself out. That's, that's good. All right, verse 6, we have to deal with this, this uh, the end. Moreover, he said, this is their eye. And notice in the, in the uh, NET, eye is, is in quotes there. This is their eye throughout all the earth. Does anybody have a different translation than eye? Do you, do you have something about sin or iniquity or anything? In your, what's, your, what's that? You have iniquity in yours? Uh, what, what translation do you have? ESV? Okay. Right? Iniquities in yours. You have iniquities in yours. Sins are in yours. Okay, NLT. All right. So here's the issue. Okay. Um, and I'm not going to pull out my little tablet and draw and all this sort of stuff. But um, in the Hebrew text, the word for I and the word for uh, sin or iniqu iniquity, they're only one consonant different. Only one letter is different. And that letter is the, the, the yod. It looks like a, just a little, whoop. it looks almost like an apostrophe sometimes. Well, if, if you make it a little bit too long, whoop, then it looks like a vav, which is, would change the word from I to sin or iniquity. Okay? So, is it I, whoop, or is it iniquity, whoop? Okay? I love doing that. I did it because a couple months ago I was in, in, uh, in Brazil, and I was teaching and about the uh, the rapture of the church. And I said, and he's going to come and take us, boop, just like that. And I looked at my translator, and I said, you got to do it, man. And so he translated into Portuguese and said, boop. <laughs> and then I did it two more times. He's like, I was really starting to like you. And <laughs> I'm like, this is how you know you have a good translator, because he's willing to, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm okay looking stupid, boop. You know, but I, you know, to bring somebody else into my foolishness is a little weird. But he did a really good job. So we have uh, I, whoop, and we have uh, uh, sin or iniquity, whoop, a little bit longer. But I think it's actually a play on both words, okay? Because what they were, what the whole point is, is that uh, if if you go with the translation, some commentators go with the translation I. This is their I throughout all the land. This is what they look. Either this is what they're looking for. Is sin and wickedness, their eyes are constantly looking for wickedness, looking for sin. Or maybe it's how they appear to other people seeing them. This is how eyes are seeing them. They are wickedness and sinful. Or if you go with sin, it's their sin is showing all over the earth. 
Okay, this is just what people know about them. So either way you go does not change the interpretation, doesn't change the meaning of the passage. So you're like, oh no, you know, our, our, our Bible is, is, is uh, um, uh, at the mercy of somebody who didn't write one stroke of a letter correctly. No, I'm pretty sure God's bigger than that. Pretty sure God can handle whether it's a short one or a long one. And he made the, it means the same, the same thing. So whether Israel is looking for wickedness and iniquity and sin all over the earth, or whether that's how people see them, doesn't really matter. And so this is what's, this is how, this is where Israel's at. Now remember, he just got done in, in the first half of the chapter in vision, the sixth, the, the sixth vision, he just gets done telling them, you're still under the law, don't break the law. And now he says there's still a ton of wickedness in there. Um, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the Greek translation of the Old Testament uh, and, and other translations that are built on that, that's where sin comes from instead of uh, just, the, just the I in the Hebrew text. So we've got this ephah, we've got this basket, and inside is a woman. Now, if you've got a mini basket, then it's probably just a, you know, maybe it could be a statue. It doesn't even have to be a, 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 like a real woman. It could be a statue representing. Or you've got the oversized basket and there's a woman inside. There's a heavy lid to keep wickedness at bay. Like you said, there's a lot of wickedness, right? We need that heavy lid. Here's what I find interesting. Is that the angel, apparently, uh, that was helping Zechariah understand this stuff, sort of lifted the lid just a little bit. You know, you're, you're cooking something, and you just want to see, you know, is it boiling yet? Is it whatever? You peek just the lid, and what happens? If, if, it's, if it's boiling, as soon as you lift the lid, what happens? Starts coming out, right? The steam comes out. You know, if you're, not, if you're too close, you get steam. You know, your glasses all get fogged up. You know, you open the oven just to check, and right? That's what he's seeing here. You've got this basket with this woman who represents wickedness, so it's full of wickedness, and all they do is they take a little peek from this, with this cover, and even the tiniest peek started allowing wickedness to come out again, to the point that verse, uh, verse 8 there says, um, and he pushed her down into the basket and put the lead cover back on top. The Hebrew word for pushed here is in a particular tense, that intensifies it. It makes it really strong. And so some of the, 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 the uh, different translators or commentaries that I, I was looking at, they said, thrust her, threw her back down, jabbed her down. <laughs> like, it's not just, now go back into your little hole and put the lid back on. It's like, quick, get it on there, and just pushing, pushing, pushing. There was this huge, almost upset as he lifted the lid and wickedness started. Even the peak... Even just, I mean, there's a whole principle there, isn't there? Isn't that a huge principle? And forget Zechariah, forget the law, forget Moses and the Old Covenant and, New, and Israel and everything. I mean, we see that today. You get into a, a position where you're just like, oh, I'm just going to take a little peek at sin. What's it do? It starts to overwhelm. Just a little peek can overwhelm us. There's a whole principle by itself. Much less when it's, it's or much more rather, when it's, it's a whole nation. And so Zechariah's like, I want to see what's inside. The angel said, see, ah, you know, and close it back in. <laughs> get back in there. Get back in. This is wickedness. This is, this is, this is lawlessness. I looked again, verse 9. Saw two women going forth with wind in their wings. They had wings like those of a stork. Have you ever seen a stork? Other than the cartoons, I know, you know, the cartoons with the baby and everything. But a stork has these huge wings, sort of these heavy wings, okay? And I think it's just, the, the women aren't identified. It's interesting that uh, uh, angels, I don't think they're angels, it, it, you know, it's just my opinion. Angels always appear as men, all the way through the Bible, start to finish. They always appear as men. They never, ever appear as women until we get into fiction, Right? Fiction, modern fiction, cartoons, you know, they always, you know, they, you know these, these, these ladies who are, these women who are angels. Um, in the Bible, they always appear to humans as men. This would be the only time that angels would be appearing as, I don't think they're, they're angels. Um, they may be messengers of God. They may actually be messengers or attendants to this woman. 
They may actually be trying to help her because of what they're going to go do. Either way, uh, they're not identified. We don't know who they are. We don't know if they're supposed to represent someone specific or, or just general. It doesn't matter. They have wings. It doesn't say they have storks' wings. Notice the word like. <laughs> it's not women with you know the bird wings on. But they have wings on them that are like stork wings, big, heavy, because apparently this is a heavy basket. It takes two of them with some pretty strong wings to carry it away in this vision. What's interesting here... Um, two things. Um, nope, we're not going there yet. Um, is that two Hebrew words here. The word for stork is just, just slightly different. Like there's an ending to the word from the word chesid. Now is that, have you ever heard of a chesidic Jew or the chesidim? These are the very faithful, the very orthodox Jewish people, the, the, the Hasidim, the Hasidic Jews, are the very orthodox, faithful ones. And the word for stork, the word translated stork, is Hasidah. There's just a little bit of an ending on it. So there could be a play on words that uh, this could be God's messengers, God's faithful ones who are purging wickedness from the land. So that's one way to look at it. Okay, uh, I already said the other way would be that there are attendants from wickedness that are taking her into Babylonia to build a temple for her. The other thing is that the word translated wind, here's cool, the word translated wind is ruach, ruach, and it can also mean spirit or breath. And so if you're, if you're looking at this from the, this is God doing this, You've got faithful ones, these chassidim, with the spirit under their wings, taking them away, helping purge the wickedness from the land. That's a pretty cool way to look at it. It okay? doesn't have to be that way. There, I mean, there's two ways to look at it, and, and it could be both. Again, it could be both, because God is the only one who can purge wickedness ultimately. Anyway, they lifted up the basket between the earth and the sky. Verse 10, I asked, where in the world are they going? <laughs> Where are they going? They're going to the land of Babylonia. The land, uh, maybe your translation says Shinar. It's the old word for Babylon. Um, uh, and they're going to build a temple for her there. And when it's finished, she will be placed there in her own residence. Doesn't that sound an awful lot like wickedness is going to thrive there? Wickedness is, is going to thrive in Babylonia, in Babylon. Wickedness is going to be worshipped there. That's what it sounds like. There are, there are some people, and this is what I'll show you on the next slide here. There are some people who say it can't be idolatry because Israel never went back into idolatry. I, I mentioned that. But, but one of the things that changed in Israel at this time was a, I mean, they did worship another god in the sense it was the god of money. It was a commercialism. Now, Without getting into all of the stereotypes, we've heard of the stereotypes of Jews and banks and money and all that. It's not where we're going, okay? But let's at least admit that stereotypes come from somewhere. Every stereotype that we have may or may not be true, but it comes from somewhere. Something started it. There's a kernel of truth in every stereotype somewhere, all right? Even if it's been so exaggerated that it doesn't look like the truth anymore. Well, an ephah was a basket for measuring grain, not just for the purpose of measuring, but also for the purpose of selling. And some people look at this and say, this is specifically referring to the commercialism that did come into Israel at this time and has characterized the nation for a long, long time. And so, if that's true, the, the ephah may refer to commercialism. And what we find is that in in Nehemiah chapter 5, which is only going to be about um, 80 years or so after this, after Zechariah, by the time we get fewer than 100 years, less than a 100 year period, Nehemiah chapter 5 describes these Jewish people in the land cheating their fellow Jewish people, feeding their, or cheating their fellow Israelites. And how do they do it? They do it by selling them short 
I'm giving you more than, or I'm giving you less than you're paying for. And I swear to God that I'm honest. Does that sound like anything we've already seen? Theft and false swearing in my name. Less than 100 years later, they are doing this exact same thing. They are cheating each other. They are stealing from each other. The rich are stealing from the poor by setting up false scales. One of the things God hated was false scales. And they were thieving, stealing from their fellow Israelites. Malachi chapter 3, verses 8 and 9 says they're even stealing from God. God says, you are robbing me. They said, how in the world are we robbing you? Because you make all this money and you are not obeying the tithes and the offerings that you are supposed to be bringing to me under the law. So they're cheating each other, stealing through each other, and they're stealing from God. And it comes down to money. And a lot of people think that's what this is. Additionally, if you go to the book of Revelation, chapter 18, and I do actually want to do this, and then we'll we'll close with just a couple of closing thoughts. In the book of the Revelation, we see a woman, sort of like in the basket, we see a woman who represents both the religious and the commercial system of Satan's world. This is after the church has been raptured away. This is when Satan is controlling the world. Um, we call it sometimes the tribulation period or the seven years or the 70th week that Daniel talked about. And for seven years, Satan is going to control this world. And uh, the illustration in Revelation chapters 17 and 18 are a woman who represents the religious pagan worship and this commercial system. Well, in in chapter 18, if we go down to verse... Um, uh, verse uh, 11, I just want to read you through this because listen to, listen to the response when God finally does destroy this wickedness. By the way, she is called the uh, Mystery Babylon. Same word, same name as in Zechariah chapter 5. Babylon the Great. Um, from a religious standpoint, she's considered a prostitute. From a... Per, uh, uh, a um, commercial standpoint uh, she's considered just uh, this um, uh, this devourer then the merchants chapter 11 uh, revelation 18 11 then the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn for her because no one buys their cargo any longer cargo such as gold silver precious stones pearls fine linen purple cloth silk scarlet cloth all sorts of things made with citron wood all sorts of objects made of ivory all sorts of things made of expensive wood, bronze, iron, marble, cinnamon, spice, incense, perfumed ointment, frankincense, wine, olive oil, costly flour, wheat, cattle, sheep, horses, four-wheeled carriages, slaves, and human lives. This is like an entire catalog. <laughs> I mean, you're scrolling through Amazon at this point. You're just looking at everything that's for sale. The entire system, not just parts of the system, Parts of the system will be disrupted earlier in, in, this, uh, uh, in, in this judgment. But th now the whole system is coming to a crash. The right fruit that you greatly desired has gone from you. All your luxury and splendor has gone from you. They'll never be found again. The merchants who sold these things, who got rich from her, will stand a long way off because they're afraid of her torment, what she's been being tormented. They'll weep and mourn saying, Whoa, whoa, oh, great city. This is Babylon. Dressed in fine linen, purple, scarlet clothing, adorned with gold, precious stones, and pearls, because in such a single or because in single hour such great wealth has been destroyed. Every ship's captain, all who sail along the coast, seamen, and all who make their living from the sea, stood a long way off and began to shout when they saw the smoke from the fire that burned her up. Who is like the great city? They threw dust on their heads and were shouting and weeping, and mourning. Whoa, whoa, oh great city, in which all those who had ships on the sea got rich from her wealth. Because, she's, because in a single hour she's been destroyed. And then this parenthetical, rejoice over her, O oh heaven. 
you saints and apostles and prophets, because God has pronounced judgment against her on your behalf. And that really is where this prophecy that Zechariah sees is really the point. The point is God is aware of what is happening. And God has determined, He's promised to punish sin, to purge the nation of Israel from their wickedness. And even though that wickedness is going to replant itself and, and thrive in the future, God said ultimately He'll destroy evil altogether. And only God can do it, right? We can't do that. We can't purge evil from our land. They couldn't purge evil from their land. God is the only one who can do this, and He's promised that He will. And so our question, our application, is not what do we have to do. Remember, application, applying the Bible to our lives, only sometimes is what should I do about it. Go ahead and look through Zechariah chapter 5 with flying objects and scrolls and stuff. What are you going to do about that? You know, make sure that you don't have a bad dream, I guess. <laughs> that's, not, that's not the application. The application is not always what should I do, but many times just what should I know. And I think in Zechariah chapter 5, our application, number, our first application principle is God knows what's going on. And He has promised He will punish sin, He will purge sin, and ultimately He will um, finally destroy evil altogether. And so, for us, what are you trusting Him to accomplish in your life? And are you living in obedience to Him? Or is there something that needs to be purged in your life as well? I think this is the principle, this is the, appli the, the application that we can take from Zechariah chapter 5. What are, you, what are you trusting in Him to accomplish? Are you trying to do it all on your own? Are you trying to do your own willpower? I can obey, I can do all this. It's not going to work. We need to trust Him. On the path toward Jesus that we talk about here, we need to persevere, we need to obey, so that we can keep moving toward godliness. And then... Is there something in our lives, you know, maybe, maybe we don't have a whole basket with wickedness inside where the tiniest little peak is going to, you know, blow up our whole lives. But is there something that maybe a tiny peak will blow up your whole life? Is there something inside you that needs to be purged? And you know about it and you're willing to live with it right now? Or what's going on in your own life? I think there's a principle that we can take from this weird, weird passage in Zechariah chapter 5.